good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Commander Monica Johnson. I'm the commanding officer of the Reserve Center just up the street here in Quincy. Um, first off, we'll parade the colors. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Founded on the love of God and my neighbor, 
on the hope of pardon for my offenses, upon contrition, upon the duty as well as the necessity of supporting with patience the inevitable evils of life, and the duty of doing no wrong but all the good I can to the creation of which I am but an infinitesimal part. Sadly today, the descendant of John Adams and friend to United First Parish Church, Douglas Adams, cannot be with us as he recovers from recent back surgery. And uh, the, the mayor of Quincy, Tom Coke, also sends regrets as the storm response has him well occupied today. Um, also, I do not believe Alexandra Elliott of the Quincy Historical Society can be with us today as well. However, we do have, I want to acknowledge, Professor Marianne Holtzum, who is visiting us from Georgia. The professor is writing a book about John Adams entitled, Monuments Will Never Be Erected to Me, by the story of John Adams. Uh, and finally, it is my pleasure to welcome our minister, Reverend Rebecca Froome, uh, who will lead us in an invocation. Invite us to take a deep breath together. Feeling that spirit of life and love that moves within, between, and beyond us all. Take a deep breath together. Here in the heart of Quincy, in this place where John Adams lived, learned as a child, developed his own moral compass, his understanding of faith and duty. Here in this room, history is so strongly with us. And I invite you to lift your hearts, open your hearts, in a spirit of invocation, listening in these words for the language of faith and meaning and conviction that is most meaningful to you. Eternal Presence, known by many names, known in many ways, be with us this morning in a spirit of respect and reverence and curiosity as we remember and honor the life, the learning, the legacy of President John Adams. In our time together, let us appreciate how wondrous it is to be together, face to face, screen to screen, screen, mind to mind. And let us open our minds to reach out and touch history, knowing that we ourselves are part of history. That just as our ancestors learned and lived and became leaders in the city, so might we all discover and rediscover, remember and act on our own sense of duty and purpose. In this time together, let us create meaning. Let us listen to one another. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Nina Liang, President of the Quincy City Council. Good afternoon. It is an honor to be here with all of you today on behalf of the city to celebrate one of our nation's founding fathers and the legacy that he and his family left behind in shaping the city that we all call home. More than ever, these past two years, we have had to understand the importance of relying on others, and that ultimately, we cannot succeed alone. We're gathered here today around the theme of duty and faith. And this time has not only compelled us to remember our duties to one another, but to have faith that there will be light at the end of this tunnel. While it hasn't been easy, we've been successful because we've come together. We've come together despite our differences, despite our individual hardships, and despite all of the challenges constantly thrown at us every day. All of them come out of these unprecedented times better, and more importantly, together. There's that saying that a rising tide lifts all ships. 
And I believe that our city, because of the community that we are, has been that rising tide. We've come together to support our small businesses, to reach out and lend a hand to a neighbor, and to ensure that what we've had to endure, we are not doing so alone. Our founding father, John Adams, inspires us with this legacy to continue to rise to the challenge of what it truly means to serve others, to be unafraid to challenge the status quo, and to be visionaries in moving our city forward together. Let it continue to inspire us, inspire us to lift up the lives of all of those who we serve. Thank you. We're delighted to have representatives from four of our local secondary schools and uh, to have students from each of those schools share their thoughts around uh, our theme today. So first of all, from uh, North Quincy High School, I invite Dominique Dang to come forward. Good afternoon. I'm honored to speak today to remember President John Adams on this important day. I'd like to thank you for the invitation, and I'm proud to be representing my class and our school today. Every weekend, my mom, aunts and cousins, and my grandpa and I drive to the local cemetery to visit my grandma's grave. It's usually not a sad occasion, it's quite the opposite. We talk about our busy week, we reminisce about the past, our parents' childhood in Vietnam, and our relatives. These past few weeks have been a little different. Now, my mom, aunts and cousins, and I go to the local cemetery to visit my grandma and grandpa's grave. Our conversations are muted, silenced by the recent emptiness of my grandpa. I see a lot of Adams in my grandpa. I think it's their fierce loyalty, moral compassion, or just their stubbornness. Most importantly, I see Adams' moral and familial duty reflected in my grandpa. Adams' duty to his jobs and beliefs is echoed in my grandpa's duty to help others and his family. While researching about John Adams, I came across a sentence that encapsulated him well. Quote, Adams had a penchant for doing the right thing most especially when it made him unpopular. And there are a few examples of this, like his decision to resend delegates to France for peace negotiations after the XYZ affair, despite public and federalist disappointment that there would be no war, or his defense of the British soldiers during the Boston Massacre. Adams believed that everyone was entitled to a defense, regardless of their background, loyalties, and actions. He felt obligated by moral and national right to defend the innocent and uphold the law. Although the colonists were upset by the outcome and by Adams' decision, it was an honest and fair trial. It is important to note that at the time, Adams was publishing anonymous newspaper columns condemning the increased taxes in the British, yet his morals and duty to justice were of greater importance. Similarly, my grandpa believed in helping out. In Vietnam, he was an interpreter for the U.S., where he would serve as a bridge between his American co-workers and the people of the towns. When he immigrated to the U.S., he again worked as a translator for the Vietnamese Community Health Center. This time, he served as a bridge between Vietnamese immigrants and their new life in America. After he retired, he would always tell his stories about his work friends, the parents, or the patients he would meet, and how he assisted others in the neighborhood. For both of them, it was their duty to adhere to their beliefs that propelled their careers and decisions. And it was their familial duty that inspired people around them to continue their work. My grandpa instilled a deep love of learning into his daughters. And my mom wrote with Rubik's Cubes, challenging puzzles, and the desire to learn more. And it was not a surprise that I grew up in a similar way. My grandpa loved reading everything from newspapers to encyclopedias. And one day he could be reading about the American Revolution and the next a new art show in Boston. His books and stories taught me to be curious, to always ask questions, and maybe love learning. Adam's story can only be considered empty if one does not include his wife, Abigail Adams. Her writings and correspondence laid the foundation for women's suffrage through the 19th Amendment. Her beliefs on female education, women's rights, and slavery were not only her duty to her growing nation, but to herself and other women. Their son, John Quincy Adams, began his political career abroad, accompanying his father. He served as his father's translator and secretary, establishing himself as a renowned diplomat. Even though Adams was often away from his family for extended periods of time, his duty to his family is evident. From the 1,160 letters Abigail and John exchanged to the countless trips the father-son pair made, the Adams family's responsibility to their beliefs, nation, and each other is something we should all strive for today. 
So I'd like to let my grandparents' familial contributions and duties to his daughters and granddaughters not be forgotten, but cherished. But it was he who inspired those around him to help others and enjoy learning. And let Adam's patriotic contributions and duty to our growing nation not be forgotten, but honored. But it was he who laid the foundations of our own government today. I'd like to conclude with a quote from John Adams. Our obligations to our country never cease, but with our lives. We ought to do all we can. My grandpa and John Adams did all they could for their nation and beliefs. Now it is up to us to continue their duty in our nation, our families, and our lives today. Now it is up to us to defend, help, and care for others. Now it is up to us to continue President John Adams' legacy. Thank you. Good afternoon. Americans today often talk about the rights and freedoms we enjoy as citizens. Equally important, equally as important, are the duties and responsibilities we have as citizens. In examining John Adams' life and his writings, it is clear that he believed fulfilling your duties as a citizen was crucial to being an American. The duties John Adams performed in the founding of America fill volumes. To highlight one of his duties, he spent five years away from his beloved wife, Abigail, and the family while serving as a diplomat to Europe during the Revolutionary War and the early Republic. Most of the duties of a citizen do not require such a sacrifice. One duty we all have here is to stay informed of the issues that affect our communities. In order to do this effectively, we must take the responsibility to become educated. John Adams was a strong believer that it was a citizen's duty to become educated and the city or town's duty to provide a public education. Throughout his time, throughout his life, Adams continually expressed that it, was a, that it was the duty of good citizens to be educated. It was so important to Adams that education be maintained and accessible to all Americans that he put the idea into the Massachusetts State Constitution. In 1780, Adams penned wisdom and knowledge as well as virtue diffused generally among the body of the people, being necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties and as these depend on spreading the opportunities and advantages of education in the various parts of the country and among the different orders of the people. John Adams felt deeply about the relevance of education and virtue. Throughout his writings, the importance of remaining wise and educated is undeniable. He believed that education was crucial to support and ingrain the principles of humanity and preserve one's rights. His goal was to protect and reward institutions that promote learning. Adam proceeds, it shall be the duty of legislators and magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth to cherish the interests of literature and sciences. As it is the duty of the government to cherish literatures and sciences, Adams ensured that the needs of scholars were being met. Overall, John Adams would be pleased to discover that today education is available to students of all genders and races. Not only did Adams believe it was necessary to obtain an education, but his perspective on schooling is the foundation of our current public school system. He believed that students in all towns should be, able, should be able to go to school publicly funded by the town. In 1782, John Adams wrote a letter to Abbe de Mobley on the proper method of treating American history. He states, There are schools in every town established by an express law of the Every town containing 60 families is obliged under a penalty to maintain constantly a school and a schoolmaster, who shall teach his scholars reading, writing, arithmetic, and the rudiments of the Latin and Greek languages. All of the students of the inhabitants, the rich as well as the poor, have a right to go to these public schools. Adams clearly indicates that he believed it was the state's responsibility to establish schools and teach students regardless of their social status. He believed everyone had a right to education and a right to partake in schools established by the government. Schools were crucial for the development of a nation built on the idea of self-government. Adams believed readers and citizens had a duty built on the idea of self-government to take advantage of the educational opportunities so they could contribute to inform decision-making as America grew and encountered new challenges. A recent challenge has been COVID-19. 
School leaders, teachers, and students quickly adapted to remote learning so the duty to provide for and to engage in education could be maintained. Although students were not able to physically attend school, remote learning was a strong method of maintaining Adams' goal for an educated citizenry. John Adams introduced the concept of duty to his son, John Quincy Adams, as well. He stressed the importance of moral character, self-discipline, and a strong educational foundation. In a letter to John Quincy Adams, John Sr. wrote, Dear Sir, if you meddle with political subjects, let me advise you to never lose sight of decorum. Assume a dignity above all personal reflections, and avoid as much as possible a party spirit. In addition to his words, Adams' actions guided his son down the path of civic leadership and putting the good of the nation ahead of their personal concerns. Among these lessons, Adams warned about the danger of infighting between political parties. Unfortunately, his thoughts have not been able to prevent the growing division between the Republican and Democratic parties within today's society. He foresaw that government parties would be at war with one another, in a sense, in which they have a personal agenda rather than a united interest for the nation. Perhaps if more citizens embraced John Adams' interest in education, citizens would force the political parties to discuss and work together for the good of the nation. Adams encouraged his son to educate himself and study the political parties in action. On September 13, 1790, John Adams wrote a letter to his son, John Quincy Adams, in which it stated, I wrote you before today, but I forgot to say several things. Have you ever attended a town meeting? You may there learn the ways of men and penetrate several characters, which otherwise you would not know. Here he is encouraging John Quincy to observe and understand that the leaders may be more interested in power than in governing for the good of the community. Adams expands the realm in which a civic leader must act. He believed that it was important to put your country first and counteract the harm done by those who put their selfish political goals first. So many of the ideals of the nation that we know today are due to the foundation of our education system and civic responsibility promoted by John Adams. Adams was able to realize the future of this country depended on the citizens fulfilling their responsibilities and embracing certain standards. Standards of virtue, wisdom, and knowledge. Thanks to Adams' interest in education, he was able to lay out the building blocks for this country and leave this foundation to his son, John Quincy, and all future citizens. With this, he left behind an influential legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. I didn't realize that that was going to be a jewel reading, so I wanted to acknowledge Chloe Gora for uh, her participation. Thank you very much, Chloe. And finally, representing the Woodward School, Zoe Maher. Did I pronounce that right? Tell me what it is. I'm Zoe. Zoe Maher. Yeah. Zoe Maher. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you. 
few years created feelings of uncertainty that I thought were related only to those who lived in the past. The type of uncertainty that John and Abigail Adams must have felt throughout their lives. Uncertainty that was conquered time and again by their courage and their sense of duty. When a smallpox outbreak hit Boston in the summer of 77, while John was away at Congress, Abigail took their four children to Boston to be inoculated. It was a precarious procedure that involved scooping pustules from a smallpox patient and placing it into an incision on the arm of the person seeking inoculation. It did not prevent illness altogether, far from it. It just reduced the risk of death and led to immunity. Sick with worry yet filled with pride at Abigail's courage, John was unable to return home. Time and again, honor and duty to the cause of America would keep Abigail and John apart. Duty was the driving force of John Adams' life. He was bound by duty. Duty to the cause of America. Duty to the common good. For John and Abigail Adams, duty was synonymous with sacrifice. After four years in Congress, it was duty that took John Adams and 10-year-old John Quincy on a perilous journey in the dead of winter across the ocean to France. Adams wrote, I should have wanted no motives or arguments to induce me to accept of this momentous trust if I could be sure that the public could be benefited by it. It was duty that kept Abigail here to maintain the farm in John's absence. All sacrifices were made for the public benefit, for our benefit. It was duty that would take him back to France, this time with two young sons in tow, a journey they narrowly escaped with their lives. It was duty that kept him on the hunt without all important recognition by other nations of America's independence. It was his unmitigated, relentless determination and diplomatic brilliance that brought us the 1783 Paris Peace Treaty that ended the conflict with Britain and cemented our global status as free, sovereign, and independent states, the United States of America. It was duty that kept him abroad for almost a decade, sacrificing so much of his personal life for the cause of America, for us, and it was duty that brought him back to his country to serve as its first vice president under the new constitution. And it was duty that propelled him to hold the highest office in the land, serving as the second president of these United States. John Adams once said, Posterity, you will never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make a good use of it. So what would John Adams leave our duty, the beneficiaries of those sacrifices he and Abigail and so many others made to preserve our freedoms? What would he believe our duty as citizens is today? I believe we can find the answer to that question in section 2 of chapter 6 of our state constitution, in which John Adams declared, Wisdom and knowledge, as well as virtue, diffused generally among the body of the people being necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties. It shall be the duty of the legislatures and magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences. For the promotion of agriculture, arts, sciences, commerce, trades, manufactures, and the natural history of the country. To countenance and inculcate the principles of humanity and general benevolence, public and private charity, industry and frugality, Honesty and punctuality in their dealings, sincerity, good humor, and all social affections, and generous sentiments among the people. John Adams explicitly states that it is the duty of our government to educate all of us, highlighting science and literature as required to achieve the knowledge and wisdom necessary to preserve our rights and liberties and sustain our democracy. What is implicit in his declaration is our hope, our duty as citizens. Abigail Adams explained it to her son, John Quincy, like this. Learning is not attained by chance. It must be sought for with ardor and attended to with diligence. It is our role, our duty as citizens, to be active participants in our own education. Basically, 
what John and Abigail were trying to tell us is it's not enough for us to just go to school and be unwilling participants, putting forth effort only in pursuit of a good grade. This approach will do little for us and even less for the common good. We must truly be invested in our learning because that knowledge will bring forth an understanding of humanity essential to the betterment of society as a whole. Engaged learning will not only make us empathetic and kind and conscientious, it will also make us innovative, diplomatic, and determined. Because if we approach everything that we do with awareness, consideration, kindness, empathy, and humor, if we all do all of that, if we recognize this as our duty, then every aspect of our society will not only benefit, it will thrive. Now more than ever, I see the imperative of what John Adams believed was the roadmap to sustaining our democracy. John Adams could have never imagined that education would become divisive or a privilege that people would take so much for granted that the individual believed it was simply a stepping stone, a qualification necessary to reap the fruits of ambition. But this passivity is perilous. John Adams never meant for education to have an end. It is an ongoing obligation, an ongoing pursuit, a duty that we must adopt in every action we take. It is something that brings us together and will continue to bring us together in a common cause greater than ourselves. It removes us from selfish and ignorant isolation and demands that we must see each other as what we are, people. Our duty is simply that to each other. And the only way to recognize this is through learning, lifelong learning. Education is about bringing people together and finding commonalities and bridging the gaps between farmer and banker, gig worker and union worker. Without the understanding that this is the purpose of education, we can never truly ensure our freedom. Without devoting ourselves to each other, to the people of our society, we can never truly devote ourselves to democracy, a state for the people. Both John and Abigail knew that this was the only assurance, because this process would allow us to recognize that our duty must be to each other, act to the common good, in order for individual liberty to be protected. John Adams didn't want us to have to make the same sacrifices him and Abigail had to make. He thought about us, posterity, every day of his life. Is it not our duty then to honor his sacrifices by heeding his words and emulating his wisdom? Isn't this how we make good use of it? I believe it is. And we must cherish it together. Thank you.
perspective. Um, obviously, the Adams National Historical Park has the honor to be the stewards of John and his family's um, homes, their possessions, um, the best way uh, to, to keep his ideas alive is for our opportunities to bring people through and witness for themselves um, the places where he lived and where he, he, he walked through daily. Uh, so John being our second president of the United States and father of our sixth president, he was born and lived right here in our community. Recently I was asked to name a hometown hero and I could have easily pursued my thoughts on Abigail or John Quincy, but I circled back to John. Although I spoke highly of John Quincy Adams' courage in the July birthday celebration, or in his celebration, his success was largely due to the sense of duty that his mother and father instilled in him as a first-generation American, although he too, like his parents, were born a British subject. John was born in a modest home on a large farm where he had the freedom to play, swim, and fly kites as a child. He planted potatoes and dug trenches alongside his father and was the first in his family to receive a Harvard education. John took this privilege seriously and tried hard to make his parents proud. He became impassioned with the past and found a calling that would help him empower himself and others to not be victims of society. It was in this home that John witnessed his father's involvement in community affairs. He was the deacon of the church, a selectman, and served in the militia. His mother and father made a strong impression on him as he reflected on their honesty, empathy, and fairness. John wrote, my father who had a public soul had drawn my attention to public affairs from my earliest infancy, took the newspaper and gave them to me to read so that I became somewhat attentive to public affairs. John's choice to be a lawyer gave him the keys to defend the rights of individuals. Of course, one of the most famous cases that he took on a matter of principle was a key, was also the key to our gaining freedom from Great Britain and this was the Boston Massacre trial, in which he defended the British soldiers. He believed every person accused of a crime deserved honest counsel and a fair trial, and he wanted to show Great Britain that we could be self-ruling government based on laws and not bloodshed. A famous quote comes from, this, uh, from his closing arguments of this trial, and that is, facts are a stubborn thing, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. John's sense of duty is reflected in the sacrifices that he and Abigail made to their happiness, serenity, and prosperity. His political success depended on him calling to serve far from home in Philadelphia and then to the courts of Europe for many months and years at a time. John's duty to his country before self was verified when he turned down a lucrative job as Attorney General for the colony. Swim or sink, live or die, survive or perish, I am with my country. You may depend upon it. And that was his ultimate response to his good friend Jonathan Sewell in 1774. Miriam and I just spoke of this the other day in the birthplace of while in Europe, John secured a much-needed loan from the Netherlands, insulted the French, but eventually proved his worth, as they did help to negotiate a very favorable peace treaty with, the Great, with Great Britain, and then he was appointed to be our first United States ambassador to Great Britain. And as an American citizen, he stood before the king of the country that he justified. In, in between trips to Europe, John was elected to draft a constitution, which was so eloquently, again, heard of, for Massachusetts. He drew upon his vast knowledge of history, political philosophy, his experiences under British colonial rule, 
and his insistence on balance of power. The Constitution includes a Declaration of Rights, including free education, which we have seen the results of. <clears throat> also, freedom of the press, the right to petition their government, the right to trial by jury, and the freedom of worship. Adams completed his draft on October 30th, 1779. He left Massachusetts in October of 1779 to return to Europe as minister plenipotentiary. His, excuse, his advice as president to his son, Thomas Boylston, later on in their life, was public business, my son, must always be done by somebody. It will be done by somebody or other. If wise men decline it, others will not. If honest men refuse it, others will not. Good sage advice. He felt his greatest achievement during his presidency was the negotiations with France that avoided the war with, with France. He felt that he was, he felt that that was the jewel in his crown after a life dedicated to public service. In a letter to his good friend Benjamin Rush on 18, the 18th of April in 1808, he was still ruminating about the duties of a president when he wrote, Our obligations to our country never cease, but with our lives. We ought to do all we can. And to continue that uh, response to Rush, he wrote, We ought to be Americans and exert every nerve to convince and persuade our country to conquer its sordid stinginess, to defend our exposed cities, and prepare a naval force. This must be our ultimate resort. The miserable struggle for place and power must be laid aside, and heart and hand united for defense. John Adams' sense of duty has us remember him for his determination integrity, and honesty. I will leave you with more fatherly advice from John, passed on to his now 14-year-old son in Europe, when he wrote, you will ever remember that all the end of study is to make you a good man, a useful citizen. This will ever be the sum total of the advice of your affectionate father. And that was while they were in Amsterdam in 1789. Thank you. Now, I ask Lieutenant Commander Monica Johnson to come forward to lead us through the lane of the presidential brief. <laughs> gather in honor of the life, the legacy of this man, this citizen of the country, citizen of this city, and here may he rest in peace, and may his spirit, his conviction live in us. Amen. Amen. 
Okay. All right, well, on behalf of the president, thank you so much for this for your amazing essays. They were, they were wonderful. Oh, so very, yes. very good. Just yes. minimizing the importance of education and you know empowering others in what John Adams stood for. So thank you. Thank you for having us, the, the Navy, um, be the representatives. We would greatly appreciate it. And happy birthday, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Uh, one of the great pleasures of being a part of uh, the community that is United First Parish Church is the opportunity to be in uh, frequent collaboration with our church historian, Bill Wesson, whose singular passion and drive and belief in the content of the history of this building uh, is kind of an animating force for, for all of us and makes today's event even possible to envision and bring off. So it's my pleasure to introduce Bill Wesson to uh, share some thoughts with us today. Thank you, Jim. I don't know what to say after that, so. I will be brief. I just want to thank everybody for attending this refrain ceremony. Uh, it's great to do it again, because in the last couple of years of the pandemic, uh, we have been able to do it. And it's great to see all the students here. I think that is great. Also, the student speakers were all wonderful. And so I think this has been a very a successful event. And this all began when Lyndon Johnson was president. And by presidential order, he said that on the birthday of every deceased ex-president, there would be a wreath ready in the name of the current president. So President Biden is the 11th president that has carried out this presidential order. Now also in that order, President Johnson said that with the Adamses, the Navy would always represent the president. So this is the 55th time we've done this. The Navy has been with us from the very beginning. And I suppose it's really, when you think about it, six of the last 12 presidents served in the Navy, and Charles Francis Adams III was the Secretary of the Navy in the Hoover administration. So there is that connection you know, with the Adams family uh, and the neighbor. But I just want to end up with just a few quotes from John Adams, uh, because uh, what he said back then really is important now, just like it was back then. And he would have been really upset about the division now in the country and uh, how this is what he said. He warned about partisanship, and he said the essence of a free government consists of effectual control of rivalries. And also, as you see all the speeches and so forth in Congress, this is what he said. I fear that in every elected office, members will obtain, obtain influence by noise, not sense. And he also went on to say, by meanness, not greatness. By ignorance, not learning. There must be decency and respect. And this is what he said about the role of government. The happiness of society is the end of government. The form of government which communicates ease, comfort, security, or in one word, happiness to the greatest number of persons and to the greatest degree is the best. And I think that pretty much sums up the attitude of John Adams. And I'm delighted that you're all here. And afterwards, if you want to get out and see the crypt and the presidential brief, our guides will take you down. And once again, thank you all and thank all the participants. I want to thank them too. I think they did a great job. Thank you very much.
just return to that deep breath of life, a breath of gratitude for all that has been shared here. Lift your hearts again now in a spirit of benediction. Reminded of the life and the legacy of President John Adams. Reminded of his conviction of the importance of education and duty. May we go forth from this place with open minds and open hearts, knowing the privileges and responsibilities of lifelong learning, knowing the power that we hold as individuals, and the power we create together as a community committed to goodness, the goodness that dwells in each and every one of us. May we go in peace and go in love. May our lives be guided by the highest ideals that we shared with President John Adams. May our lives be blessed so that we might be a blessing, so that we might bless the world. Amen. Retired Adams. <laughs>